Well, as far as the Alien Bible, I don't know what you're really talking about. Some of the briefings that I read dealt with some of that information about, uh, you know, it's being the product of, of a genetic modification. But that's about all. That's about all that I know. The repercussions, the big story, all that, you know, all that I, I really have no idea about. Well, I meant, like, uh, you mentioned the date when they were supposed to return. Is something supposed to happen when they return? I have no idea. Okay. It was just a date. And uh, it was it was a number that made no sense to me. It was a 601 or 30 something, you know, obviously in a different numerical system. And so, other than having created us and then the genetic upgrades, that's it as far as supposedly, if that information is correct. Yeah. Uh, I'm interested in a little bit more about the physics of the uh, power generation uh, from the development of the antimatter. To, uh, to the gravity A wave and the amplification and that process of the uh, generation of that and being able to fold space. That's a pretty <laughs> lengthy explanation. Um, In other words, the relationship between the development of antimatter and the gravitational force field. Well, it's I can give you, I, I guess, a brief overview essentially how that works. If you want an in-depth description of that, you can give me your address and I can send you a paper on it. Um, essentially, what the reactor does <coughs> is provide electrical power and the base gravity wave to amplify, and it does that by interacting matter and antimatter, essentially. Uh, the way it does that is injecting an accelerated proton into a piece of 115 that spontaneously generates uh, anti-hydrogen, essentially. Uh, that's reacted in a, um, a small area. It's a compressed gas, probably a compressed atmospheric gas. And uh, you know, the antimatter reacting with matter produces the energy, uh, mainly heat energy. And that is converted into electrical energy by a thermionic generator. It appeared to be 100% efficient, which is, you know, a difficult concept to believe anyway. Uh, also, the reactor has two functions. That's one of them. The other function is uh, it provides the basic gravity wave that's amplified, and that appears at the upper sphere of the amplifier itself, and that's tapped off with a waveguide similar to microwaves, and uh, is amplified and focused, essentially. So how is the electrical energy related to the amplification of the gravitational A-wave energy? The electrical energy is, is no. transmitted essentially without wires, and I related it to uh, almost a Tesla setup. It seemed like each subcomponent on the craft was attuned to the frequency that the uh, reactor was operating at. So essentially the uh, amplifiers themselves received the electrical energy, like a Tesla coil transmits power to uh, you know, a furnace to do. Uh, and uh, what was the rest of the question? Yeah, in other words, what is the relationship between, I think that's, you basically answered. Yeah, that's, that's how the amplifiers receive the power through the waveguide to receive the basic wave. It's almost, it's very, very similar to a microwave amplifier. And, uh, you know, for more technical description, you know, I can send you drawings or things along those lines. But uh, that's basically how it works. I understand you took some one, <coughs> 115 home with you to uh, do some testing on your own. You I, I obtained it, yeah. <laughs> did you uh, document any of your testing? Yeah. You did? Yeah, the video, mostly videotape and things like that. John said it was stolen from you later? Last night he said? They stole it back. Stole it back, he said? <laughs> well, there's another level to that, but like I said, right now it's in private hands. Okay. John said last night that a piece, a wedge that's about two inches in length, will run the ship up to 30 years. How does that go in my view? How long does that be? Well, it really depends on the energy level. The, the more energy you expend, the uh, you know greater consumption of fuel, just like in any any modern machine. So it really, it really all depends on the amount of energy you request. At, but. 
Dr. Keller's relationship to S4, do you think he might be working on antimatter weaponry? I don't know, but he was certainly, uh, I forgot what his exact title was. He was chief consultant or something along those lines. And as far as any matter weaponry, I don't, I don't think anyone was involved in that. There was certainly some uh, beam weapon work, and uh, you know, Teller has been involved with that. Uh, I think his last project at Livermore, Los Alamos, was um, I think he called it Super Excalibur, and that was essentially a uh, nuclear bomb detonated in orbit and fiber optic light guides that directed X-rays to uh, incoming warheads and. Uh, that's his pet project. He loves that thing, so I don't think he jumped to uh, any matter weapon. <laughs> All the way in the back there. What, uh, on your sports model that you worked on, what do you think was on level three, and where were the bathrooms? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't know if anything was on level. Well, I don't know if there were any bathrooms on level three. I can only guess, and I would imagine that there was some sort of navigational equipment or their version of a computer or something along those lines because I saw nothing else that uh, controlled the, uh, the amplifiers, the directions they pointed at. Bob, how do you foresee that mankind can develop this type of machine? Uh, I really don't. I really don't without access to certain materials. Or maybe new manufacturing techniques that can produce those, but uh, until those problems are solved, you know the fact that we even know how to how to deal with it or even duplicate it, uh, you know, it's pretty useless. How many other materials might be necessary uh, besides 115 that you know of that, that were, were contained on the ship? That might be it. The might the rest of it might be just uh, <coughs> essentially polishing up manufacturing techniques, th making things smaller, you know, just general increase in technology, getting a, a small accelerator, running at a, a, a higher energy level. Uh, I don't know about the, the metallurgy aspect of the craft. I don't think any exotic metals are necessary, though they may be employed. Uh, I don't, I imagine you could make a craft out of aluminum if necessary, but uh, what part that plays, I, I don't know. Is there any significance to the saucer shape, the geometry, having to do with any resonance or anything of that nature? Not any resonance, but it's important most of the edges on the craft are rounded because a high voltage field does appear at most of the craft, except for the upper, the last upper bump. There's a little ring before that. Now, I'm only talking about one craft, so I don't know about the rest, but there's a small ring before that, a darker black one, and that's an insulator ring, and that's the only place above that, that upper section, the third level, is where high voltage does not appear. Did any technology that came from the aliens resemble anything that we can do today? Have we advanced to any degree that, that they are? <coughs> well, there are some basic things. Um, you know, the fact that they're using a little accelerator, a little bit smaller, you know, we have things like that, if that's what you're getting at. Uh, and, anything you know, really advanced? Uh, well, as far as controlling gravity waves, you know. <laughs> yeah, other than the fact of the, just the way the craft operates, you know, by manipulating gravity, that's, that's about it, really. Well, I wanted to ask you, talking about metalwork, uh, what you observed in terms of uh, the structure, the skin of it, the thickness, because, you know, there were reports from Roswell and otherwhere that there was a very thin type of metal skin that was really un undamageable and so on. What, what was this construction of the body? Well, I called it metal, and uh, I really can't say that's what it was. I called it metal because I slid my hand across it, and it was cold, and it was semi, you know, lustrous, so. Did you notice any place like, where, you know, on an edge or something where it may have been a lot thinner than your standard metals that are air balloon that's an aircraft? Balloon? It's hard. To, from the outside, you can't tell. No, when you walk in, the way the, the way the archways are inside, they're probably about uh, four inches thick anyway, so you really can't tell how thin the, uh, the skin is itself or if it's exotic or right. inside. Uh, yes, more on this element 115 and your contention that it couldn't be made here on Earth. Uh, what if you found the, the right bombardment speed, the right target shape, and the right containment? Well, you, I imagine with enough time you can make a small amount of it. I mean, my analogy is look at uh, 
you know, look at how long it takes to make gold an accelerator from bismuth or something like that. Uh, but that may just be a technology that hasn't advanced far enough yet. <coughs> right, but the bottom line is you have to sit there and plug in protons and neutrons, for that matter, into an existing atom, and you have to do it, you know, essentially on an individual basis, and they're not all going to catch on, they're going to... But how, did, how do you think they got their first piece of it? It was in a, a dead star. How uh, going from? I think it was naturally occurring somewhere on their planet. Just because it's stable, yeah, probably so. That's just a guess on my part, but uh, you know, if that technology was harnessed quick enough, chances are they didn't have. Uh, you know, when they came here, our levels of technology were probably fairly new to them. They probably never even considered an internal combustion engine, or for that matter. <laughs> You know, when they came flying into the atmosphere and saw little cigar-shaped things with fire coming out the back, they probably couldn't conceive of how they were powered. So it was, uh, you know, <laughs> it just all, all depends how, you know, what materials, raw, raw materials you have. But, uh, you know, that's just an opinion that that was a naturally occurring moment. Probably true. Are you aware of any long distance flight test that was done on any of the disks? As of the time that I was there, I was told that they didn't, they really didn't take them any great distance at all, other than right outside the... Have you heard the rumor of the policy ever killed by finding the No. If we had a working agreement with the aliens at one time, um, why didn't they give us a user's manual for these ships? Why have we had to work so hard back engineering them? I have the slightest idea. <laughs> you know, Have you assisted us at all with any of the technology and running it? I, I really don't know. You know the, the it, it almost seems like there had to have been some assistance or some information found, but. But who knows? Your information didn't indicate that. No. Yeah, uh, with such tight security around there, suppose only 500 pounds of this material, how is it somebody can get some of it out of there? Because some of the, not some of the material, the material is, that they have there is essentially raw. The material is, it has to be machined into disks. These disks have to be stacked up and then cut into a cone shape and then sliced uh, along the long axis of it. That work is done at Los Alamos. I don't, I'm not exactly sure all Los Alamos knows what they're doing. Uh, apparently they think that they're developing uh, the little coins they're working on is some new type of armor. And uh, having worked at Los Alamos and know people around that area, that's how I obtained some of it. Can you say anything about Project Looking glass and the relationship between gravity and time. Well, gravity and time are almost essentially the same thing. Uh, and looking glass dealt with using gravity essentially to distort time. And, and as I've said before, I really know very little about that. But you know, they're only talking talking about milliseconds or even less microseconds of uh, time distortion. They're not like looking back in time to see who killed Kennedy or something. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, the craft that you are you talking about the scout craft is that the one that's like the Adamski picture with the three domes underneath? And if it's not, I'm not exactly sure what the Adamski okay, picture. Okay, it's the saucer shape. But has this is a, three this is the one that uh, looks like a my one of the Meyer craft. Mm -hmm. did, did you see you, any others than that one, or is there nine up there? Or yeah, I saw nine total, but that's the only one I got close enough to. Did you, you see the one with the three domes underneath that? Uh, three balls underneath that has the central housing underneath. And no. then the, the second question was, um, did anybody give you any indication as to who was driving or, or any information on that? I assume that it was humans that were violating the craft. Uh, though it, it could have been remote control, but at the one test flight that I saw on the ground, uh, they were in radio communication with someone, and I assumed it was someone in the craft. I, I imagine it's possible that it could have been a remote observer somewhere, but... Uh, and I just assumed that the seats were retrofitted or they were sitting on the floor for that matter. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, are you familiar with, uh, I have a couple uh, aspects of the question, are you familiar with Howard Menger's Electrocraft and uh, Otis Carr's uh, saucer design? And how are those, how are their devices, uh, uh, how, do they, how do they generate their gravity fields and compared with what you've described? And lastly, uh, can you, can you, can you speculate how the, uh, why the commercialization of some of these crafts hasn't been possible with 
so many different uh, patents applied for uh, these kinds of uh, design problems. Because they don't work. <laughs> Are there any G-forces encountered no. by the products inside the crack? No, no, no. no, no. Uh -huh. uh, from your interviews, you seem to feel that the uh, Area 51 or the S4 test site was kind of slipshod in how it, how it does its research. It really doesn't have the facilities there to actually do the research correctly. And also, I'm wondering, uh, could you comment about that? And also, I'm wondering what you could tell us about the other types of ships you saw there that you felt were alien in origin? Well, the, uh, as far as the research at S4, that was kind of slipshod. Uh, just because, mainly it was being done from a military point of view. Uh, if anything, it was a weapons development program, and they were more concerned about with duplicating the technology not really duplicating the technology, duplicating the hardware, as opposed to back engineering the technology to find out you know, how these theories actually work and uh, you know what's going on with them. And, and so they really weren't taking the scientific approach, and that was causing some dissension. Uh, I don't remember the second part of the question. Um, just what other types of ships did you see that might have been alien in origin? I only saw them, and they varied in shape, but I was told they had the same identical uh, power and propulsion system, and that's the extent of my knowledge on them. What about shape? They varied completely in shape. Yeah, on that, uh, you had the military out there supposedly working with the aliens. Did you ever get uh, inference from them that it was a positive or a negative situation? In other words, when they brought up, uh, when they were... Uh, talking about the aliens or whatever, was it a positive or a negative type slant on, on the... Well, they really didn't talk about the aliens. Uh, the only time I ever heard anybody mention anything about an alien, someone, and I'm just assuming that, someone called it, or called the thing a gourd. And that was, that was it. I heard it in the middle of a conversation and they stopped talking when I got up to them, so... That was the thing. Later. Nothing along those lines, but uh, what I call the console, there are three seats. Uh, if you look at the bottom level, there's the three amplifiers in a triad formation. Directly above each one is something I call a console, and I think that's... Uh, a secondary part to the amplifier, and an, a an analogy to that would be that would be the actual amplifier, and the thing hanging underneath would kind of be a, a speaker if you're talking on audio terms. So, no, no on switch. <laughs> not, not that I could find. Yeah. Did it seem like there was any place or even a need for a light support of any kind? <laughs> not that it was obvious to me. Uh, two questions. How do they navigate and how do we converse with them? I haven't the slightest idea how they navigate. You know, like I said, I think if that, uh, whatever controls the configuration of the amplifiers, the focusing, which is basically their, their navigation is most probably on the upper level of the craft that I didn't get to look at. It. And as far as the conversation between them, I, your guess is as good as mine. Was the local means of propulsion the same as this uh, across no. space differences? What, what was the local means? The local means of propulsion is essentially them balancing on you know, an out-of-phase gravity wave. And it's not as stable as you would think. When the craft took off, it, it wobbled to some degree. It's, uh, I mean, a modern-day... Uh, Hawk or Harrier or something along those lines, a vertical takeoff craft is much more stable than them in the uh, Omicron configuration, which is that, that mode of travel. The Delta configuration is where they use the three amplifiers. And uh, you know, that's, those, those are the only two methods I, I know about for moving the craft. Can, can one pilot, as far as you know, pilot this uh, craft, or does it take three, or do you know anything about that? I, I don't know. Okay. Oh, and back in the red? Yes. Yeah. Uh, You're rolling around. Was that stable? In other words, does it give off the radiation? No, it's stable. Yeah, theoretically, elements, uh, 
re should reach a stability around anywhere from 113 to 116, somewhere in there, and uh, apparently that's true. And again, they should reach a stability somewhere up around 220 some odd. But uh, you know whether those elements will ever be synthesized or found naturally. Yeah, it's not unusually heavy. Yeah. Um, I want to know what you think of, mon uh, of the monuments of Mars, and do you think we have bases also? Do I think we have bases now? Uh, the monuments of Mars are interesting. <laughs> That's about the uh, the most I can say. It's it, they're suspicious, and uh, yeah, I really don't know until there's more information. Yeah, I've seen pictures of them and, and things along those lines. But the uh, most recent Mars probe is taking uh, low altitude photographs of those. So I guess everyone will know in about a year. <coughs> Indirectly, yeah. What about your perception of time and length, width and height? Is it the same aboard the craft as off of it? Why do you want to board it compared to when you went off of it? Why do you want to board it when you went off of it? Well, as long as you're on the craft, everything seems completely normal to you. Time flows at a normal rate and uh, if you're off the craft and you're comparing the time of someone in the craft to someone off the craft, there'll be a definite difference there. Anything where gravity's involved, you know, even the shuttle astronauts, they'll come back just because of the difference in gravity. When they come back, there, uh, you know, there'll be a, a slight difference in time. Did you learn of any other well-known civilian scientists who were involved in this? Uh, yes. Not, not involved in this, but involved in the gravity work. And he's at Los Alamos, and we've had a little bit of contact. Can you name names? I'd rather not, just because so far no one's bothering him, and I'm sure he wants to keep it that way. <laughs> 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 only one place, yeah. Only one, so the whole craft can no, no, it was only one one place where the seats faced, and it, uh, you know, there again, I said that's advanced technology, but it's not that advanced, because, you know, we have something along the lines of that liquid crystal that we could, you know, make transparent and also use as, uh, you know, a display of sorts, so that's, uh, but this was metallic, and we haven't anything along the lines of the uh, toughness of, you know, metal that you could drill into that can become transparent. And what was the time period when Probably about 30 seconds or so. Yeah, two related questions. Are you aware of any instances where the inside of an alien craft is much larger than its apparent outside? No, I've heard stories like that, though, but I haven't. Uh... The if I can just follow that up. The, uh, oh. Oh. The, uh, Go ahead. the strong force which you've identified with gravity A, I know there's been some recent theories that propose actually the 11th dimensional universe would set it up and rolled up. And I'm not saying that. Does, does it operate on any principle related to that? Yeah, my main problem with that, and Stephen Hawking for that matter, is that uh, once you start creating other dimensions, it's like an excuse. I mean, in particle physics, they do that too. When they can't figure out something, they say, well, you know, we don't know what gravity is. Well, it's caused by the, uh, the graviton. Yeah, they make up particles like that. <laughs> you know, and you can do that with dimensions too. Where'd it go? I went into another dimension. Yeah, it's like an excuse. The bottom line is, you know, as everyone has said, every physicist has said, the answer to everything is always simple. And it's, there's not an 11 dimensional universe. It, it does, first of all, there doesn't need to be because all this technology works, you know, one, Dimensional, essentially a four-dimensional universe, and and uh, you know there's there's no need for it. Yes, I have questions, please. You said in your video that in order for you to work from Las Vegas to Green Lake, is that right? Yeah. How did you get from Green Lake down to Green Lake? In a bus. There's a facility on the other side of Green Lake, on the east side of Green Lake. Are you familiar with that? On the east side of Green Lake. Across the lake? Yes. No, I've never been over there. Did they ever tell you, did you get anything of the work that was done on the west side of the lake? No. Bob, uh, getting back to his question about if there is any difference between being on the inside of a craft while it's under power, 
versus being on the outside of a craft. Of course, you wouldn't have experienced that because you weren't you were never on the craft when it was powered, right? Under power. Or well, by the fact that the screen became transparent and other things were operational, I can assume that it was there was some power generated. So. Oh, I see. So, okay. Huh. Bob, uh, how long were you a part of the S4 project, and, and how key of a person were you on the science team? That <coughs> I was probably there only six months, four months, something like that. It's hard to remember. And as far as a key person, I'm sure I was the last rung on the ladder. Uh, though, because no one has really gotten anywhere, you know, they were looking to me for fresh ideas, which I really didn't have any anything because I didn't know what you know really was going on or where they had been. So, uh, it was a very disorganized group, and that's that's really all I can relay. I don't you know I don't know how else to describe it. It was frustrating in that regard. Very frustrating. Element one fifteen. Does it have emission lines? Does it have emission lines? Spectral. Well, I imagine it does. Every other element does. Yeah. That you know of. That well, no, I haven't seen you know any spectrographic analysis on it or uh, well, actually, they did do it. I don't know if I if I saw it though. I saw a neutron bombardment test and density measurements and things like that. But I I'm sure they carried out that that test on it. But I wouldn't be able to identify the lines. No. You're not aware of the results. You know, they probably showed them to me, but I can't for the life of me remember after four years. <laughs> Uh, in possibly in heavier stars or in you know planets that uh, so you know surround a larger star system. And uh, in fact, some people brought up that uh, some people brought up that you know well, that's that's ridiculous because you know all the elements that we know of are found on Earth, and that's you know that's not true. I think it's uh, technium. Or something along those lines is only is not found on Earth and it's on the periodic chart, so it's not as a Hello, Dad. Doug, and they mapped it out in the south of France. They looked back and looked, and it has to fall where the natural belt of uh, uranium is there. And I was wondering if you know you had anything that would lead you from what you saw with that propulsion system to think that aliens may have come here at one time to uh, do that. I don't know. I mean, no matter what, uranium is certainly a, a valuable right. you know, element. Uh, I don't know. Did you get to see any aliens at all? No. Back when you talk about low-level flight. You were talking about a wobble. Mm -hmm. Have you ever seen the Billy Meyer movies? Mm -hmm. It's similar to that. The Billy Meyer movies. Jones. Jones of this. Jones of, of this. Hey. <coughs> I saw, still, I don't think I've ever seen any motion. Yeah, he's got some that fly around a tree and they've got some. Oh, wait, I did see that. Yeah, I did see that. And then there's some other hovering ones where they wobble. You know what's strange about the Billy Meyer photographs? That, 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 the discs that one of the ones he took a picture of looks exactly like the one that I looked on, but yeah, you know, I'm certainly not an expert in the field, but some of those look unbelievably fake. And I can't, it, it, especially the thing with it flying around the tree, I mean, it, boy, it looks like it's hanging from a string. But, you know, but why would he do that if he had some authentic pictures? And uh, you know, I don't know. I, I have mixed feelings about that. How do you feel about, or, or do you have an opinion of this conflict that allegedly happened between Grays and the Delta Force in, what was it, 89 or whatever? Do you anything about that? I, I really don't really have an opinion. I just, you know, repeat it. You think it really took place? Boy, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, apparently there's one, but I was involved in the project that dealt with it. Well, it's really not a next video. There's the, the video that I made is being redone by another company only because they liked it so much. And uh, they're just redoing the uh, graphics and making it a little more technical. And you know, I'm just serving as a technical advisor on it. But uh, for the most part, it's 60 to 70% of it's you know the identical thing. They just uh, wanted to do it 
because these particular group of guys uh, involved, I think companies called DreamQuest, involved in uh, special effects, were really into the UFO thing and they wanted to do it with modern day stuff instead of, you know, knit stockings and things like that. <laughs> Well, it's certainly possible. You know, I don't, I don't have any information on that, but just by the EMP generated, you know, by the systems on the craft, that, that makes perfect sense to me. I was going to ask you, what kind of weapon do they have? I, it's some sort of directed energy weapon, and I think it's a... Uh, like a laser beam? Well, no, an, an, a particle weapon, a, probably a neutron. How many levels does that S4 have, do you know? Just one, or just the world around, or...? There, there might be two, but I know there's one because obviously I was on one. But uh, I can't actually remember if anyone, if there's any direct mention from there of there being a, a lower level. But you know, I really wasn't allowed to roam freely around the whole place, so I don't know. You know I really don't know. Bob, could you tell us about your education? Not a couple of different conflicting things I'd like to hear from you. <laughs> that varies widely. Uh, I, as far as uh, electronic technology, my degree there is from Caltech, and physics is from MIT. When did you graduate? Did you go to Pierce College? Yeah, I did. Okay. Where did you hear that? A friend said something that you know, somebody I don't even know, I, I just thought, well, it's something I want to ask, because it's clear from my mind. Yeah, I went to Pierce and Northridge, and then... Uh, I'm, by, you know, I'm terrible at dates. I don't remember what date I was at. Pierce. Probably like in '76 or something. I was at Pierce, and then '77 or '8, I went to Northridge just for a short time for some classes, and I was at Caltech, and then MIT after that. Yeah, some critics have suggested that there is not a Department of Naval Intelligence as shown on your W, your IRS record. I wonder if you could address that. Yeah, I've heard people say that before, but the bottom line is if you, uh, and I've let other people check into that. Uh, Bob Exler is a guy that managed to trace that down through the IRS, and if you write the zip code number on the bottom of it, or NC-101 or something like that, or NC something anyway, it gets to it gets to somewhere in the Navy. You know, as far as if there's a department there, you know, I don't know. But uh, you know, that's that's the W two that I got sent, so Well that same person was saying though that the zip code that was on there was someone that was in reserve, unused in Washington zip code. That was unused? Yeah. Well no, he had he had uh, correspondence with someone in the Navy through that address. I'm not talking about Bob Exler, I'm talking about Bill Moore. Oh, Bill Moore, I don't, I don't know, Bill Moore. <laughs> I know, he's an enigma in himself. Yeah, I'm I saying that was his point. He, I guess he disputes everything I say. He said, well, there's two right. different types on here and this, and I said, well, you know, <laughs> I don't know. So, uh, you know, that's basically what I get sent, and, uh, you know, I, I've seen enough information to where that zip code works. And uh, okay. that's all the information I have. I really haven't pursued it myself. But maybe you clarify for them why you think this is a legitimate document because of the certain elements of it that are, are correct. Well, well because of the amount of money. Right. Yeah, no one would yeah. know the amount of money yeah. except me. And, and the that was correct. That, uh, you know, so <laughs> that's all the information I've got. Huh? Well, I have two questions. Uh, they're not related to each other, but one is are they silent or noiseless? And uh, B, who signed your paychecks? As far as are they silent or noiseless, uh, there's a slight hiss before they take off and up to a certain altitude. And that sounds like um, a high voltage hiss of sorts. Uh, that's all the sounds that I've heard. I've heard lots of reports about, you know, weird flying saucer type sounds, but uh, you know, I've never encountered that. Um, who signed my paycheck? There was a signature on it, but I don't know, you know, whose it was. They never even, you know, the time that I cashed the paycheck, I, they never even concerned me tracing anything down. So there wasn't a company name up in the corner, like this paychecks. Well, when I worked for the yeah. federal government years ago, all you no, get that, uh, is a green treasury check. There would be no other papers with it or anything from the Department of Treasury. No, was, this said the Department of Naval Intelligence on it. On the check. Yeah, on the check. Okay. <coughs> Thank you. Bob, a craft like that 
comes into our atmosphere, would you expect a, a loud report that might be exploded? Well, it's solely dependent on the velocity that it enters. So if uh, you're dealing with something that manipulates gravity and doesn't have to slingshot into the earth, uh, you know, you could come in at a low speed, not heat up, not not really encounter anything. But velocity dependent, is that so? Right. Well, yeah, if you're traveling it's supersonic, then you get a report. If you're not, you don't. You know, it's pretty straightforward. Uh, when you were at S4, to your knowledge, what was the approximate percentage of civilian versus military personnel, and in what kind of uh, job categories? The civilian personnel were uh, scientific in nature, and the military personnel were only uh, security. And as far as the percentage, it was a small percentage of uh, scientific to uh, military personnel. Are there any secretaries? There, I'm sure there were offices all over the place, but when I came into the facility, I was essentially escorted right to where I work and worked there, other than the few amount of times that I got to walk into the hangar and uh, under an escort too. And when I left, it was the same. So like I said, there might be offices, there might be bunkers in there, there might be underground levels, there might be an alien nest in there. I have, you know, I have no idea. <laughs> Excuse me? How did you eat? How did you eat? The only place I ever ate was at Area 51. So if there was a cafeteria there, I never got to eat in it. Did you come and go with other people? I usually came with Dennis Mariani, who was my supervisor. Now, I wasn't on uh, a full-time swing, essentially. I flew in usually between 3 and, or between 4 and 5 o'clock at night and left by 11. So I was only there for a short time each day. Hmm. On board the bus from Groom Lake to Papoose, how many people were on that were boarding with you? Uh, Very they, few. More than one, more than yourself. It's me, me and Dennis, and usually, well, or actually not usually, occasionally one other person. How about Barry? I don't think I ever saw Barry on the bus. Just two of you. Mm -hmm. Is there a chance that any of the workers might defect? Yeah. Barry would. That's why I spent some time trying to get a hold of him. And there was actually some time after all this hit the news and the whole thing went down, we got a call from Dennis, my supervisor, and he arranged a meeting at the Union Plaza Hotel. And when we got there, I brought three people with me, and I think he said he'd be in the casino area somewhere. And we went. I think Gene Huff came with me, and uh, we went into the area, and walking down. The corridor, I recognized one of the security personnel from there. And then when I finally found Dennis, he didn't even acknowledge my presence. Uh, we couldn't get his attention, and uh, you know, I left. So apparently, either someone had known of the conversation and sent someone down there and made themselves obvious to Dennis, or, or something happened and we left. But I think that was uh, where Dennis really wanted to say something. Uh, I understand that you used hypnotic regression to get at some of the details of your experience. If so, what is your impression of hypnotic regression as a tool? It's probably reasonable because uh, there are specifics. They contend that you can sit there and reread a document as if you had, you know, as if you were there reading it for the first time. And uh, what I was mainly interested in was in some of the schematics and drawings. And uh, you know, I did some of the hypnosis stuff with Lane Keck, uh, the hypnotherapist in town, and uh, I was certainly able to redraw uh, a lot of the uh, schematics and you know, engineering drawings along those lines. And it's, uh, so a as far as using it as a tool for that, that seems to work. Uh, for anything else, I don't know. Uh, I have two, two things. Uh, one's a comment, the other one's a question. Uh, first of all, um, when I was 12 years old, I, I saw a daylight flying disc, which looked exactly like one of Billy Myers' photographs 15 years later. And uh, and this... Just you mean before, earlier? No, uh, earlier, 15 years earlier, I saw this disc, and then Billy Meyer took a photo in 1975 of the same, exactly the same disc that I saw. You know, down to the last detail, it was the same. And then you said that the sport model looked a lot like the same photo in an uh, interview with George Knapp. And uh, I thought that was really interesting because it kind of tied it all together for me. And then uh, just, I just wanted to make that comment. 
And then the uh, question I had was, uh, what was the year of your graduation from MIT, and, and did you get a PhD? No, it's a master's degree. Just a master's uh, degree. The year, what was the year of graduation? Probably, probably 82, because I think I left there. You went to Los Alamos? I went to Los Alamos. Is there some, can you talk about the mind control that uh, some people have said was used on you uh, when you decided to leave and also the threats? What mind control would that be? <laughs> uh, someone made a comment that, uh, that you might have been a uh, victim of some sort of mind control. Or, or that came about by, uh, when I was first brought there, they had a, a doctor, or a nurse actually, in a uh, medical, medical setup there. And, Right after I had signed all the release papers and my first time out there, I went in and they did what I perceived to be an allergen test because they put a grid on my arm and different, uh, you know, pricked me with different chemicals and, uh, you know, it was their invention that, well, boy, there's a lot of strange elements here and unusual things you'd be working on, so they're trying to see if you're going to have any adverse reaction to them. And uh, I was given something to drink. I, I said it smelled like pine, uh, which it, it did. You know, it's, that's the best way I can describe it. And uh, a lot of people jumped on that saying, aha, well, that's the mind control substance. When you leave work, you're going to forget everything. When you come back, you're going to remember everything. But, you know, I think if anything, it was an anti-allergen drug or something along those lines. How about the threats? threats being used? Yeah, the plenty of threats. Well, I mean, can you, can you speak of, like, bodily harm or the loss of pension or what, what kind of stuff? Was well, the loss of pension and... Uh, you know, jail time, that was part of signing the paperwork. As far as bodily harm, after they caught uh, us the time I brought out John Lear and a couple other people up there, then they threatened me, and uh, they really didn't get much reaction out of that. Then they threatened my wife at the time, and, uh, you know, that, uh, they really threw out everything they could, you know, without physically, you know, attacking me. Well, that's what I was wondering. And once they knew it was really you and not Dennis or someone else or anything, why didn't they just arrest you under charges of you know, violating the act? Well, they can't arrest me because they'd have to admit, you know, that this is classified material. Well, you were talking to, about Yeah, it. they'd have to release it. You know, why right. did they, you know, kill me? Right. Uh, <laughs> I, you know, that I really don't know. You know, maybe that had to do with uh, how I got the job or, you know, referencing the connection to Ed Teller or something along those lines. But uh, I don't know. Were there any contractor names, departments, divisions that were mentioned or signs on the wall or anything like that referring to any companies or anything like that? No, but I know EG&G had nothing to do with it. <coughs> that's the only light I can shed on that because uh, I had mentioned that to them once because that's where I was interviewed at the EG&G building and uh, I thought that it was part of an EG&G project and I think it was Dennis who said that, uh, you know, we don't let those people, you know, anywhere near this place or any, you know, they were just a, a sore thumb to them. Well, as, a, as one way of getting this information out, and at the same time to have the government stop harassing you, did you ever consider bringing them to court? Suing them, charge. well, threatening you and your family, true. harassing you, and as a result of that, forcing them to... With what evidence would I do that? I mean, it's hard enough to, to prove it to... Uh, you know, the layman in general, but taking it to court, it's impossible. I mean, there's, uh, so you you know, there's plenty of people that don't believe me anyway. So you never sought out legal counsel with regard to any of this? Well, a, a little, well, yeah, initially. And, uh, you know, the bottom line is, you know, the attorney said there is absolutely nothing to go on. It's a total waste of time. And, you know, if anything, it's going to be a public forum uh, to discredit me in, in some manner. So, uh, you know, why even go through with it? What about class action with ACLU? That's but still, you need, you know, some sort of evidence that uh, this happened. Even if I pulled out a piece of 115 and said, here, well, what does that have to do with anything, you know? And uh, there's nothing that, uh, and what did they do to violate my rights that I didn't agree to at the beginning? Right. So they really had their bases covered. It's pretty dirty what they did to you in Las Vegas there in 1990 in the summer. That was pretty dirty. <coughs> what was that? It's a court. Well, yeah, that was, that was my own fault. <laughs> so you've been through your counseling yeah. by saying that, right? How would um, someone get a piece of paper explaining the physical properties used in the in this mode of transportation? The physical properties, or, you I mean? mean uh, I mean the the formulas used in the in the gravity. You're being uh, watched for any interaction. 
<laughs> Strange you should mention that. Uh, there has been nothing uh, for probably these four years or three years, whatever it's been, but uh, the other day, uh, one of my phone lines has not been working and the, the other one was breaking up, so I called Centel down and uh, they checked the house out and said there's nothing in the wiring here and they called me down from Charleston Boulevard from the from the telephone pole and they said my individual line was cut and that the other one, the other wires were stripped and twist tied together. So, of course, me being paranoid thinks, well, someone tapped in there, but I really can't think of another excuse as me being, uh, you know, just my single lines being played with. But uh, that's what he said and, you know, they filed a report on that, so that's one form of documentation. Uh, you say your records at Caltech and MIT have somehow disappeared. Yeah. And Los Alamos and yeah. probably everywhere else. Is there any way you could you could re reconstruct uh, your coursework and your professors? Oh sure, I've got people that uh, you know that I went to school with, and you know, George has spoke, George Knapp has spoken to some of them, and you know even flew with me up to Los Alamos and spoke to my colleagues there, and uh, you know it's just. Could you could you reveal some of your professors at MIT and Caltech? Yeah, if you want. I don't have a list of them here. Dr. Duxler, I think, was one of them, and. Uh, Hostfield was another. Hostfield? Hostfield. H-O-H-S-F-I-E-L-D or something along those lines. They remember you? Oh yeah, Hostfield I know well. These were at MIT or Caltech? Uh, Hostfield was at uh, MIT. De Duxler was at Caltech. Yeah, um, who's Barry? <laughs> Barry's a guy I, I worked with. A, uh, essentially work on the buddy system there and uh, someone you have ideas to bounce bounce off of and uh, Barry Castillo or Castile. Was he there before you or? Yeah, a long time. Still there or? He's probably still there. Did you get any information from him? Well, he essentially taught me everything that they had done up to date. In the course of your work, no, they did mention though that uh, this was the place that all of this stuff was brought to, and it was really purposely condensed here to keep an eye on everything and to have uh, you know immediate access to everything that dealt with this uh, you know the alien technology. Regarding the craft, uh, the alien craft. Um, were, is there any test personnel that crashed them, and if so, do you know about what the causes were? I didn't read about any crashes during tests at all. Though you'd think that there would be some, but uh, I didn't. When, uh, when you were at Caltech, were you affiliated with any of the student houses? No. Um, when I first heard of uh, S4, it reminded me a lot of disk testing that I've heard of that goes on in Australia at Pine Gap. And I was wondering if you know anything about Pine Gap. Did you read anything about Pine Gap that you could tell us about? Uh, I really don't keep abreast of the UFO information. As far as officially, I never read anything. I've heard the name Pine Gap mentioned, but uh, <coughs> I haven't heard anything about that. Has anybody ever approached you with a screenplay offer? Oh, God, yeah. <laughs> Constantly. Constantly. Do you ever consider it? Uh, yeah. The main problem, Columbia Pictures last year really wanted to do it, and uh, they said we're making a screenplay, and, and my only problem is is that uh, if you guys are going to make a movie, it has to be exactly what happened and not the Hollywood version. I don't want to see Steven Seagal in it or anything. <laughs> No, that's that's a really good question. I, like I, I've always said there's plenty more people qualified than I am, and uh, if there's any re there's only two reasons they could have. Is either number one uh, was that Dr. Teller essentially juiced me into the position that said, you know, there's a guy Bob I know him, find a place for him, or that the fact that I have traditionally approached everything from a very strange angle and uh, you know essentially off the beaten path and you know tackling you know, technical problems and uh, so it's only one of those two reasons and unless there's a third one that I, I have no idea about. Uh, two things, do you think they'll ever release this information and if they don't, how do you think it'll ever come out? 
besides people like, you know, or it will be something like what you're doing? Well, hopefully it's not this way. Hopefully there's going to be a release of information eventually, but, uh, you know, whether or not they're going to say, uh, you know, hey, we've been keeping the secret for so long, it uh, almost seems to me that they need a staged incident to, to get them off the hook. Take a flying saucer up in a C-130 and push it out the back and say, look, it crashed. You know? <laughs> <laughs> How would they overcome the G-forces in the rapid change? They don't apply once you've distorted. Distorting gravity, essentially having a gravity amplifier, distorts time and space, and that those really don't apply. There's no interaction. So there would be no effect on humans either? No, there's no effect inside at all. Bob, did your, uh, when you were working on the S4 project, did your education and whatever scientific vision that you have permit you to believe that at some point you'd be able to make a meaningful contribution to the program? And, and if so, after how much time and project? Uh, I was always in serious doubt whether or not they were going to get rid of me because uh, I had, you know, there really, really wasn't anything that I could contribute. I wasn't an expert in any particular field uh, that they were dealing with. So, uh, I mean, I made some contributions as far as uh, uh, determining what element they were dealing with was, but... Uh, that was significant, right? Yeah, <laughs> to, to some degree. Yeah, um, I was like, uh, when you were at uh, Cal or MIT at Caltech, I forgot if you had a master's here, doctor, or whatever. But um, did you come from a pretty? Uh, your, was your your education pretty traditionally grounded as far as your own views, as far as physics and what is common knowledge, as opposed to your other things? And in other words. How surprised were you when they started showing you all this hardware and these concepts that could do things that is really... Oh, very. I was... How long did it take you to start drafting that? Even when I was reading the documentation, you know, the, the alien the alien question really never entered my mind. I kept pushing it off to, you know, all this group of scientists secretly came up with... Now, I never... And I, I just had a mental block against that because I always thought flying saucers were totally ridiculous, and the people that uh, you know really paid attention to such phenomena were were just out in left field. You know, they belong. Thanks, Bob. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it really made very little sense to me that it, that uh, you know anyone would would deal with something like that. So I really held out to the very end, and uh, you know, they finally said, "Well, Bob." <laughs> and that was it. Did you ever hear any um, Air Force or military <coughs> squadron numbers or names handed about? Yeah, I probably did, but I can't remember. I do remember someone talking about something along those lines. Uh, I, I don't think they were pilots, but they were someone, <coughs> someone related to the Air Force. I don't remember who, or they were talking about the Air Force, and I think they mentioned a squadron, and I don't know if that was what they called the group that, that flew the craft or it was someone else, you know, at, at Groom Lake. But, um, <coughs> I really don't know. No, there really wasn't much, you know, idle banter going on. <coughs> as far as like the gravitational field with these crafts and so forth, if you were to amplify it enough, could you... Um, enlarge the area that you want to take in other words could you uh, move more than just the craft itself say two craft under the same power source and so forth or even you know even ever consider something like that as feasible well like a tractor beam it's possible as long as they were both uh, essentially in the field that was being emitted um, i don't see, i really don't know what uh you know, how the level of energy relates to the amount of mass that can be bent that way, or how the amount of space that can, you know, th those numbers I really don't have, so it's just a guess. Do you think it would be feasible? Uh, what kind of control Probably. Systems? What kind of control or instrument systems do they have? I really don't know. That uh, anything that I assume was control systems or instrumentation was up up above, and I think that's where the navigation computation took place. And uh, you know, I dealt with only the, the strict, the power-hungry components, essentially. When you were at S4, 
was there ever either a period within a day or even a couple of days where you, at this point, don't remember what you were doing during that time? And was there ever a period of time that you're not able to account for? Yeah, I kind of, I said that, and again, that's been taken and bent a lot of different ways, too. There were times that, that I left, and it's because so much stuff I was exposed to, I, I was essentially drowned in information, and, and when I got back home, I couldn't, I really couldn't remember what day anything happened. Uh, you know, did I forget big chunks of knowledge? No, I just... Uh, now, were there, like, periods of days where you're not, you haven't recalled what happened during those days? I mean, you're not able to And second, you probably don't want to get into this, but I'd really appreciate if you would. When you were walking either by the hallway or down, oh, no. there, by the door yeah. with the window in it, and you look through, do you go into that and describe what you did see? I mean, even if you're not sure, say, just state it as exactly as it was. Well, this has to be taken in the right context, too. First of all, being surrounded by the, you know, flying saucers, knowing that the alien thing exists and all this technology. Uh, you know, when I was walking down a hall to the, uh, I don't remember where I was going anymore, but the different doors to the hangars are small nine-inch square windows with wire mesh running through them. And I, I looked in one as I, I walked by and was told to keep my head forward. And uh, I saw the backs of two guys, and they were talking to a child, or I thought it was a small child, and, you know, when I, of course, when I told that to John Leary, he said, that was an alien, but there's no doubt, and uh, now, I don't know what it was, I don't know if it was a small guy, but it, it just looked weird, and it was a glance, so, you know, do I think it was an alien? No. Did you see the, the quote, small guy? Did you see the small guy, or you only saw the two guys looking downward? No, I saw the small guy. You saw the small guy that they were talking to? Yeah. What did it... Well, I, it was just it was just a glance. I have no idea. That's why I said, but believe me, if I had a rounded head and big eyes, I'd say, hey, there's an alien there. But you know, I can't say that. But it was a small. It was something. Small person or someone there. Yeah. To. See, I don't think anyone could bring their kids down there, so I don't know. But you know, for that matter, they could have been holding up. I realize you're talking to a crowd that has had a lot of personal experience, a lot of people. Right, but I'll also look at it from a technical viewpoint that it could be a model, a life-size model, and they're trying to see how, how the size relationship works in the seats and other parts of the craft and, you know, what's accessible, so it doesn't necessarily mean that it's a, a living being. Thank you. Would you mind speaking at all about how this body of knowledge has affected you emotionally or maybe spiritually? Are you frightened by the implications of what all this means? Or? No. Um, You've no doubt thought about the the overall agenda. You've speculated, I'm sure, on your own. Yeah, but it's difficult to really, uh, you know, put a finger on it since there's so little evidence to go on. And really, 99% of the stuff that I hear, you know, I really don't even come close to believing at all. And it's not just because I'm skeptical; it's because it's absolutely ridiculous. Uh, you know, I even. So it's stepping on a lot of people's toes. You know, I, I think 99% of the sightings out here are absolutely not flying saucers. Most people are watching 737s coming to uh, Groom Lake, and they may turn up there, and there's lights on the planes. And uh, so that, I mean, up along the other same lines, there's uh, these parachuted flares that they fire off near the Papoose Lake area, and they're an orange color, which is pretty coincidental, and they're on a, essentially a modified small hot air balloon, so the burning heat of the flare keeps it afloat longer. And uh, whether they're doing that for disinformation or practicing how missiles lock on to you know, heat-seeking targets, you know, I don't know. But I think 99% of that stuff is what you know, people you know, that come around this area are, well, it, are seeing. It, it seems as if even knowing that we possess alien technology hasn't even made you a believer. That's probably true. <laughs> but it has. I mean, I believe the stuff that I worked on, there's absolutely no question in my mind. But uh, I think everyone can only go so far, and I can't, I just hate to speculate because I hate to be wrong. I don't want to say, well, you know, this, they had to be given to us because, they're, you know, we didn't shoot them down, and, you know, it's, uh, so I, I just stop right there. I think I, we forget sometimes you're a scientist. <laughs> maybe so. I, I just, I stop with what I'm, I'm pretty sure with, and that's it. What is your synopsis in a nutshell? <laughs> Uh -oh. Based upon your, what you saw and what you experienced. Well, I can't. Like I said, I stopped before that. You know, I have lots of 
possible ideas in my mind, but... Based only on what your experience was, only on what you saw, what is your synopsis? My synopsis of what I know to be true? Yes. That the government is holding uh, nine alien spacecraft uh, that are propelled by uh, a modified gravity generator. Uh, it's being, the work is being conducted 15 miles south of Green Lake at that isolated area only, designated as S-4, uh, that at least one of those crafts operate, and that's about it. Okay, thank you. Bob, did you ever see the... No, not at all. Did you ever see the word S-4 written anywhere? The letters S-4? That's a good question. What was the question? The question is, did he ever see S4 written anywhere? On your badge. On your badge? Yeah, the S4 was punched out on the badge. Punched out, so you never saw it. That was more along the lines of what I was thinking was a sign, and I think, because it's hard to see, I think near, when you approach the Papoose Mountain Range, that there is a sign that designates it as S4, but if I... I, I'm pretty sure I saw a sign there because I can only see out the front window when I'm when I'm going through there, and I'm not. I'm really not sure what it what it said, but it, since most other signs designated <coughs> it's an area or tech area or something along those lines, that might have been S4 if that's if that's what you're referring to. So you just heard it orally, S4 orally, and that's how you know to designate it. Well, sent, yeah, and, and as someone else mentioned on the badge, it was star punched out there. But as far as an actual sign to the area. Uh, I didn't see it in any other writing. So did you ever see it on the badge? Since it was punched out, you wouldn't see it. Well, that's it. It really says it directly above it. I mean, the star punch. Oh, so how was it written? S4? S or? dash 4. Oh, a dash. There is a hyphen in there? Yeah. Oh. Because <laughs> Bill, Bill Moore's making a big thing. I says, how, is it, how do you write it? He's talking to George Knapp, trying to debunk the whole thing. How do you write S4? You know, <laughs> Does it make a difference? <laughs> right, right. <laughs> well, that's what you call picking news. Yeah. yeah. Well, I know there's a lot of people that don't believe the story, you know, altogether. But uh, you know, I, it's uh, it's difficult. It, it, you know, there's really a limit to what you know. What else could I possibly do? Uh, you know, to show people what happened, other than uh, you know, relaying some of the information and things along those lines. But, uh, um, what kind of work are you doing now? A variety of things. I mean, everything from uh, I have three separate companies. One is uh, deals with uh, commercial photo processing. The other one is uh, developing uh, and repairing alpha radiation detectors for radiation off of uh, plutonium. Which, unfortunately, that's going down the tubes because they stopped the testing out here. And uh, I do computer graphics, a lot of that, and uh, <laughs> actually music videos. Believe it or not. <laughs> Are you still building and racing jet cars? Well, I don't. I don't do it for money anymore. Now I just take the jet car out and run it around. But uh, it's, I kind of got scared when most. I when I originally started racing jet cars, there were uh, uh, like 25 people or something along those lines that were licensed to drive. Uh, and uh, now there's like seven. And the guy when I stopped racing, the guy that trained me crashed. So you know, everyone else is dead. So. I don't race anymore. You still have the Lamborghini? The body sitting in the backyard, the car I take out once in every couple of weeks to the dry lake and play around. Two questions. Do you have any idea how they achieve that proton source of a steady stream of such a small reactor? It could be a radioactive element. Uh, I mean, it could use. Uh, well, a proton source could certainly be. Uh, they could be using alpha particles for that matter which is essentially a helium nuclei, uh, and there's lots of elements that can do that. The other part is, uh, in the video we saw, uh, the badge had the letters, the capital letters, M-A-J, written for uh, turnover site. Was that actually on your badge? Yeah, that was really on there, and uh, I was told Majestic was the level of clearance that that was cleared for. That also, that makes you, know, you wonder about, you know, uh, Bill Moore's thing at uh, the MJ-12 documents and all that, all, all, or is that you know actual or uh, considering that uh, these guys had made posters that they're here and things like that, they could have 
taken Majestic and made it the name of it, just as kind of a tongue-in-cheek thing, uh, you know, or was that actual evidence that uh, you know, Majestic 12 actually existed and all that, so. What about your other associates? Did their badge look identical to the one we saw? Or were they Pretty much so, except Dennis's looked different, and for the most part they had different areas punched in them. At one time, you said that you thought, you know, uh, the scientific community should be the ones in charge or, you know, uh, charge the research of this and everything. What name would you put out? Who do you think would be qualified enough to head a group like that, you know, um, as far as being able to uh, decipher what's going on, you know, and stuff like that? Do you have any names you could throw out? Uh, yeah, they're friends essentially that I've worked with before, but I know what their expertise is. Actual in. qualifications go and so forth like that. And do you think that the names you come up with they get along enough, get along well enough to be? Well, able one to of them was them? Joe Vanetti, a guy that I worked with in Los Alamos, one of my colleagues, and uh, I was trying to force his resume on them. And uh, you know they did take it and look at it, and I was kind of hoping that he would uh, he would be a big boon to the project, but. Uh, you know, I'd already left by the time you know, they would have had to look at it. Uh, concerning local sightings here, uh, I've uh, personally seen uh, two at one time maneuvering, and I went to the third one later, and they looked and performed exactly like your video that you took that night that was broadcast. Uh, now, not to, <laughs> I'm not attacking anyone that's had sightings, but, uh, you know, there are a lot of there's a lot of atmospheric phenomena that can relate to, I mean, it just sound like Phil Class here, but, you know, <laughs> but I mean, just to, to sure give, in a glass house is <laughs> right. but I mean, just to give it a, a fair shake, in fact, uh, what's that guy's name, uh, Glenn Campbell I wrote that Area 51 oh, yeah. guide and uh, yeah. brought up, uh, I don't think he believes my story, but uh, I think he, uh, brought up some very good points in there and that a lot of that stuff could be mistaken and uh, if you're looking at something with the naked eye a lot of times it can look like it jumps around and, and things like that especially if you're staring at it for a long time uh, it all depends it all depends how it's like that obviously if it's something dramatic if something is close if something makes a, a tremendous jump a great distance other than a little you know tiny white light that looks like the head of a pen that's a different story that's, you know and that's if that's what you saw then that remains unexplained well, that's what I'm referring to because it was very close. Both of them were very close, and they would get brighter and darker, just like your video. Mm -hmm. Sometimes almost strobe, and they were down on the ground, got bright, took off, and moved around. And my main question was, the house was that not all of the time the light was on. It seemed like when they were getting ready to take off, they'd power up to very bright to take off. But when they were moving around. They could shut the lights completely off. Now, they can't shut them off. What happened is the craft probably pitched with the bottom towards you, and it looked like the light was off, because you can't see the light from the bottom. I see. Thanks. Uh, two questions. One is nuts and bolts, but why do they generate light? Why, why do you see any light at all? Well, uh, to, to just answer that one first is uh, that's essentially operating like a fluorescent tube. Anywhere you have... Uh, you can take a, large, a powerful radio transmitter and you take a neon tube and you bring it near it, it's going to light up just because the uh, the atoms are getting excited. And it's the, the the surrounding air. Right, you know, the electrons go to a high energy state and drop down and release a photon and that's what's going on. Okay, and secondly, just to change the venue and force you to speculate, now that you had some time to think back on some things, do you want to elaborate any more on your, uh, your ideas of what containers are and why we are referred to containers as containers? I, I can't even guess. You know, all I can say is exactly the way it was written. And, you know, it, it, because as soon as I speculate on something, you know, it's people are going to lean towards that way, and it's not fair. Did those documents at all ascribe a purpose to why these no. genetic manipulations were being done? No. You know, this was not a large briefing. I had 90% of the material that I read was dealing with my project. And when I mean briefings, I mean two sheets of paper as the, uh, just the information I got on whatever else was going on, probably to alleviate, you know, my curiosity, and that was about it. What do you know about the Aurora? Is there anything about the Aurora that you might attribute to Now, the Aurora I did see once on the way out there, and the only reason I say it's an Aurora, the Aurora is, uh, I, uh, I was told it by Dennis in the bus, and, uh, it makes an unbelievably loud sound, and, uh, I, 
I think when I heard it, I said it sounds like the sky is tearing. And from what I understand, it operates on a liquid methane powered engine. There's a, a lot of this information has gotten out in uh, uh, Aviation Week and Popular Science. And it looked, if this in fact was Aurora, it was certainly a strange aircraft. It looked like, if you know what the old X-15 looked like, a very long slender craft with short wings on it and uh, a square exhaust that had little veins in it. Uh, is, it quite, is it quite large? Is it large? Large. Yes, it's, it's quite large. It's a really overgrown thing. And uh, there were a couple of people that came up who I described the sound to. One of them was uh, John Andrews from the Testers Model Corporation, and they're always spying around to make the most recent models of the stealth and things like that. And uh, he heard the exact sound that I described. Unfortunately, he couldn't record it, but uh, that really got him lit up. And, uh, he probably has more information about it than I do. Okay, uh, quick, when, when you listen to some abduction reports, whether or not people believe it or not, there seems to be a common thread of people being moved by blue beams of light. Uh, did, you, did, did you ever talk to anybody in your work about technology that could explain that, or is there extrapolation of propulsion systems that you work on, principles that could explain something like Any that? Any of the three gravity amplifiers could do that, could lift something off the ground, or for that matter, compact it into the ground. That's not a problem. Because the craft, in fact, can operate on one amplifier in Omicron mode, hovering, that would leave the other two amplifiers free to do anything. So I imagine they could pick up cows or whatever else they want to do. But you know, on the craft that I worked on, there, were, there was actually no provision for anything to come in through the bottom of the craft or anything along those lines. So I, I don't know how, if that in fact does happen, it's in a completely different type of craft. Does a blue sound, is a blue uh, color consistent with what you would expect? That's more consistent than the graphs glowing orange, because you know the interaction of the it, it should the you know nitrogen atmosphere glow blue. Did the ship appear to be cast a piece of metal? It's not cast. It, well, at least more it was injection molded, because there was no sharp objects even where the seats meet. The floors curved. The top of everything. Uh, I think the analogy I gave it looked like it was completely made of wax and heated till it melted, and then cooled down. Everything is completely perfectly rounded in. Uh, if in fact you're talking about something that's uh, containing a high voltage field, that's exactly what you want to have to you know, prevent the corona discharge from spraying off. How can you focus a gravity wave on something that's so many millions and millions of miles away? Well, first of all, I don't think they focus it that far away. Oh. Like I was talking to with someone else, uh, I think these trips are made in several small jumps. Because the amount of energy required to do something like that in the it's not really that, not the amount of energy, but if you're looking at three amplifiers that focus down to a, you know, something the size of a tennis ball, that the amount of precision that's required to move the amplifier with minimal deviation out there eventually is going to exceed anyone's level of technology. So if you're doing a jump of a thousand miles, I mean, that's tremendously impressive if you're doing a jump. I, you know, I can't see them jumping a light year, much less 30. It just doesn't seem possible. I never heard of them. In the, the uh, video surrounding UFOs in Mexico City during the eclipse, there's some very remarkable uh, video of a, a pulsation of a, some sort of field surrounding these UFOs. Would that be an attribute, would that be attributable to the type of technology that you saw? It's possible, is it an optical distortion? Yeah, absolutely, you saw a pulse, pulse and the, the polarization of the pulse seemed to be changing as well. Hmm. That's certainly possible. Music. I think I did. Did I actually say that in the tape? Yeah. Wow. Loud music. Loud music. Yeah. Apparently, whatever. It, I don't know what else to call it other than some sort of uh, anesthetizing hypnosis along those lines. But anything that distracts attention uh, at a high level, and you know, certainly, uh, uh, you know, some sort of stimulant drug or something. Uh, 
that get someone riled up would, you know, would not uh, permit that to happen. It's just like in, in modern hypnosis, or not really modern hypnosis, but in hypnosis in general, if you're not in a relaxed state, you're not, you're not going to get into that level of consciousness. So, uh, you know, if you're in a very alert, awake state, it's going to be hard to, uh, you know, cause that effect if, you know, again, if in fact that is correct information. What context was that information in? That dealt with some of the biological effects of the uh, of the aliens on. I think essentially on the human race is what it was. Uh, is how it was termed. It, it this was in. I think it was in part of the autopsy reports because they had the single organ they had in their body uh, cross sectioned and and split up. And uh, I think there were there was a comments in there about what different functions of the brains are, and I think that's where this came up, is they're, they're trying to relate some unknown lobe of the brain to uh, to this function, but that's so typical. There again, you know, like in particle physics, we don't know what it is, so hey, that's what does it. You know, it, it's not necessarily true. <laughs> uh, yes, uh, I, I hope you'll be offended by this question. I, I have to ask it to uh, verify your bona fides. Uh, have you ever gone up by any other name? I ever gone by any other name? Uh, no. <laughs> You've been Bob Lazar from birth. As far as I know. <laughs> yeah. Uh, do you have any other biological information on the aliens besides that they had one organ? No, that's all I have, and that was uh, essentially just from looking at a photograph. So we don't know if they eat. They probably do, but I don't. Okay. This is really just a comment because you mentioned how you feel about Billy Meyer, that whole scene, but you said that the craft that you worked on looks just like the craft that from the Billy Meyer case. One of them, yeah. However, um, the beings that Billy Meyer supposedly was in contact with are supposedly full-size, like average human beings. And you said that the craft you worked on had chairs that a full person could not see on. But if you looked at the Billy Myers information, I think somewhere in there, maybe I've got this wrong because some of this stuff has gone through my head, that they, the people, the large people that apparently flew that craft, did not produce the craft. They think Billy Myers said it was, uh, it was obtained from creatures that were two meters tall or a meter tall or something along those lines. Which craft was that? The craft that they did? The, the Billy Myers. The case the Billy Myers? Yeah. Well, they claim that they were operating the craft during those contacts. Well, so are our guys, for that matter. So I imagine they could be retrofitted. But, you know, I, I don't know. I can't go either way. I, I know the one that I worked on was small and uh, was certainly uncomfortable for you know, anything in the area of five to six feet to walk around in. Bob, well, the other uh, crafts on the same aliens? I don't know. That's information that uh, you know wasn't given. To me. But I did. I think, as I said on my tape in an interview somewhere, one of them absolutely had a projectile hole through it. And uh, the only thing I don't believe it was shot down. This is a personal belief. But uh, more along the lines, I believe it stood up on its side just to see you know, how the metal would react to a high-speed projectile going through it. You were you were there for what four to six months? Yeah. Um, you had a lot of contact with security, obviously. Yeah, did too much. Have, too um, much. A regular <laughs> escort, a safe person. How did they act? It depends. Each one did you ever goes. Talk to them? You know, no, I never talked to them. I can't stand them. They only went so far. You know, if I walked, if I was in the lab area and I went to the bathroom, the guy that came with me or that was by the door went to the bathroom. He would go so far. And if I was leaving the perimeter, someone, there would be another guy that went from that distance on. Was he armed? Yeah, oh yeah. Was he uh, Army, Air Force, can you tell? I don't know. Any insignias on his uniform? No, he might have been, uh, like I said, they had a dark blue uniform, most of the guys there, except a few of the people outside had that desert camo. Head gear, beret, cap? No, they didn't have any hats on. And there was any insignia or anything on them, they just had the pistol and that was it? Boy, there, you know, there might have been, but 
you know, at the time, I probably didn't pay much attention to it. I was trying to put the guy out of my mind, not you know, study. Uh, they never wanted to talk to you. Did, it, did they all seem like a stern uh, Delta Force vibe, or were they like... Oh, yeah. Yeah, they weren't the least bit interested in what was going on. And, you know, what they've been briefed on, I have no idea. But uh, you know, to them, it seemed like we were a nuisance. <laughs> but, you know, it's the reason that they're there, so I don't know why they... <laughs> Did you ever see any inside hardware of this machine? The nuts and bolts, wires? And obviously, you probably did. Did it look like our nuts and bolts and wires we get in the hardware store? Or what? Well, as far as fastening devices, everything was formed together. There were no nuts and bolts. Uh, wires, there were no connecting wires, even between electrical <coughs> systems. Um, well, so what, what was the course of energy? How did it go from one area to another area? The best guess is essentially it operated like a Tesla coil does. It's, you know, uh, a transmitter and essentially a receiver tuned to the transmitting frequency and receives the electrical power. And you know, there again, that's not real advanced technology. Tesla did that in the 30s, I think. Lights on a console, were they plastic? No, no lights, no lights. <coughs> Excuse me. Yes. The uh, could you recount for us in detail uh, your memory of what happened the night that you and the, the group of people were discovered on the perimeter of the, uh, you know, the viewing area when you saw the captain? I bet John Lair told a different story. <laughs> no, no, it just uh, it was it was compelling, and I just would be curious to hear when he, he in particular there was one aspect of the story. He said evidently when they were uh, vehicles, the, some ten unmarked Broncos were how many? He said five on each side of the road. Ten <laughs> must have been a different time. No, <laughs> he said you jumped from the either jumped from the car or left the occupants of the car to go out into the desert so that you wouldn't be discovered amongst the people there when you return to That's true. Yeah, okay. What so really happened? <laughs> <laughs> we, uh, we drove out. Well, I mean, John Lair's a nice guy, and I, I like him, but, you know, he does have the tendency, tendency to add about 15% color to stories, and if a story goes through him twice, it's 30%. <laughs> 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 but, uh, we to what, what happened that night is we took a, uh, Jean, uh, my wife at the time, and her sister were going to go out and see what we could see because it was a test flight coming up. And John knew that we were up to something because we didn't invite him in. And he showed up at the house and said, okay, you know, well, we're going, and, you know, come on. Um, we had rented a car because the only reason we rented a car was because and sister-in-law was in from out of town. All I've ever owned usually is sports cars. They seat two people, and, uh, and that's all we had. So we had rented a car, and we all piled into that. And uh, we drove out there. I don't remember what time we got there. Uh, but we, it got dark. We waited right till dusk to drive up the road. And we got uh, probably about seven miles in, I think. And we were very careful not to hit the brakes because we didn't want the lights going on because we knew there, by watching up on the road beforehand, we knew there were security guys running around just looking. Is this the mailbox road? No, I've never been on a mailbox road. That's the only it's broom road, that, okay. you know, big one that goes up there. Well, it's probably on mailbox road, but I wasn't, didn't watch anything from there. Um, we drove in probably about five to seven miles and I had brought, we brought all kinds of stuff with us. We brought uh, Geiger counters, we brought a Celestron 10 inch telescope. I brought a 9 millimeter pistol because I didn't, I really didn't want to get caught. And uh, we came up there, and as we stopped the car, uh, my sister in law was driving. She stepped on the brakes. And so we stopped right there and just waited. We didn't see any reaction. And then somebody opened the door and the dome light went on. And as soon as that happened, two different sets of headlights lit up on either side of us. And we said, that's it. We're dead. So uh, I went in the truck and I got my pistol and I went out to the desert. They were far enough away. Oh, no. What happened? No, no, I got that wrong. We, we hopped in the car and then started really all on ass back to the exit. Thinking if we could get to the road in time, you know, we're out of their jurisdiction. There's no problem. Yeah. So we got about halfway out there and I think there were three vehicles maximum. 
I stopped and you know we had figured we're not getting out of there because uh, as we're getting close to the top of the road you can see another vehicle pull in. I said, well, you know, we're, we're trapped. So I got off and ran out to the desert. Uh, now the rest of the story is from the people that were there because I was out in the desert laying down on the ground. Uh, supposedly what happened was uh, these guys came out. John set up the telescope real fast. And uh, <laughs> that was the best excuse he could come up with. That's right. And uh, the guys came over and said, I think John interrupted him and said, hey, what are you guys trying to do, a drug deal or something? Did we interrupt something? And, you know, they kind of just shrugged that off. And John said, well, we're looking at Jupiter. And, uh, you know, they said, what are you guys doing out here? They just ignored whatever he had to say and went on for a while. I don't remember the conversation because I wasn't, wasn't there. But... Uh, now, it was pitch black. You couldn't see your hand in front of your face. It was a moonless night. And they said, all right, we'll just get the hell out of here. They backed off down the road, and they stopped. But we didn't know that and turned around. You can see all this happening, right? No, I, my head was down. Oh. I didn't want my glasses or my white face shining. So, uh, a few hundred yards away. A few hundred was... yards away, they had stopped. We, no one knew this at the time. And I came back. You know, out of the desert, and uh, you know, I'm usually very sarcastic and joke around. And uh, what I said was, when Gene Huff was standing there, and I said, "Man, we're lucky those guys didn't see the other 50 Delta Force we had out there, or something along those lines." You know, that could have taken him out at any time. And he laughed. You know, it was just—I don't remember the exact content of the joke, but uh, those guys heard that, and they're sitting there watching us. So I guess now I learned about most of this from the debriefing afterwards when they took me in. So. <laughs> The guys that were there were on top of the truck or jeep they had, and they went to arms because they thought there were guys standing out there. So they had us all under gunpoint, we didn't know what was going on. And we're sitting there talking about everything that had happened, flying saucers and all that stuff, sitting on the bumper, and we're just looking off down the road, and we see a little green light drop on the ground and roll around, and it was a night vision scope, and someone picks it up and it disappears. And you know, we all said, well, let's get the hell out of here. What's that? What happened? So one of the guards had dropped a night vision scope, and it rolled on the ground, and we could see the little green image rolling around, and you see it pick up and, you know, and disappear. And it was only, like, from here to the, you know, the, the netting over there. That was the, the distance, because it was completely dark. Wow. And uh, so we got scared, and, you know, as soon as we got in the car, we all agreed, they're right there, you know, and they heard everything. So we took off, and we got to the, you know, top of the road, and Lincoln County Sheriff was there. And that was another major hassle, so he wanted to search the car, we wouldn't let him, and he was in radio contact with the base or these guys out there, and uh, they said, where did the extra guy come from? <laughs> and, you know, that completely confused him, because they had never, I guess they had never seen me come up or something like that. They thought I was another guy that walked around, however can. Anyway, the, the big problem was that there was another guy, and I think legally they can only hold you there for an hour. And we were there for like 59 minutes, and he said, you know, okay, go. But, you know, he really wanted to search. Well, I got to backtrack a bit. John Lair made the colossal mistake. We were under just minimal suspicion at the time, and he asked for everyone's ID. And in the trunk, we had everything, the Geiger counters and all that stuff. And, you know, the, the people that didn't want to show their ID said, well, we don't have it. We left it at home, and the other ones that did, you know, took it out. And John said... Wait, mine's in the trunk, and he opens the trunk, and here's all the stuff laying there, and that's, and that's when the cop decided to keep us for a long time. We've always hassled John about that forever. And uh, he said, so you guys are out here with a Geiger counter, a telescope, and all this other hardware, sound equipment, and video stuff, and you're just out, you know, just out walking around, and, you know, we all said, yeah, and, you know, so that's when he kept us, and that's, how, that's really what happened that day. And the following day was a, a work day for me, but I was uh, taken into debriefing, and yelled at for a long never allowed to return to the S4 after that time. Right. Well, that was uh, that was kind of a turning point. <laughs> you fired then? You officially fired? No, I was never fired. See, at the time, they were going to pull my clearance before that. So it's, I don't know if that was ever clear. The main reason was for me not progressing any further there was they halted my clearance because at the time I had my phone was being tapped, and I, I allowed that. I signed the... Uh, you know, the order to do that, and I'm going through my background, and, uh, you know, at the time, I, you know, didn't tell my wife what was going on until later, and, you know, as things progressed, but uh, she was having an affair with somebody on the phone line, <laughs> and uh, it was her flight instructor that I was paying for flying lessons, by the way, but uh, as uh, this was going on, just like in, you know, the astronaut program, not only do you have to have 
you know, security as far as uh, no connection to foreign governments or things like that. But as far as your family life, it has to be stable because they don't want any, you know, loose cannons running around. So this was going on. I had no knowledge of it. And uh, they said, well, you know, we're going to, what they were going to do is not say anything to me and wait until one way or another the situation resolved itself. Either, you know, my wife took off or, you know, you know came to an end or whatever. So uh, when I was in... Uh, debriefing essentially that day, you know, this is when they really started attacking me and hassling me and that's when they took out the, the phone transcripts and, you know, hey, by the way, Bob, your wife's fucking somebody and that was uh, <laughs> the last time I went back. Nice. So that was a real problem. Another profound meeting. Yeah. Variety of ways. So that was... Uh, you just went just pretty bold over. Yeah. Did you see stuff about an S4 um, that you chose not to talk about? Did I see stuff at Yeah, there's more going on that, that basically you decided not to. Yeah, but not that really changes anything. It's the same thing. It's just little technical things that, you know, it's really not worth bringing up. Yeah, um, real quick, how did, did you see the paperwork and how they got, uh, got the discs to start with? No. <laughs> That's pure speculation. What did you have the guy recovers for? And do you believe that, are there dangerous levels of radiation uh, in this area because of testing they, used, they did previous to now, previous to this point? We just, I think we wanted to see the background level and uh, yeah, I don't remember, it was just like a staple to take along with it, you know. I understand right that this area tests high for radi uh, radioactivity, the, the background levels are high in this area. Is that true, do you know? I don't know, we had the Geiger counter, but before I got to measure the background, I don't, I don't know what it was. Bob, this might be important because Jacques Vallee is such stature and he's trying to debunk you on the basis of your, supposedly he's telling your report is only that you saw a DVM and a, an oscilloscope at S4. As far as the equipment there? Yeah. This is another thing that's gotten so twisted. Jacques <laughs> Vallee, who's a UFO writer or something, um, came to see me in Las Vegas, I don't remember how long ago it was, but after the George Knapp thing and... Um, he came down with some producers from Universal Studios who was going to make a movie about his um, his book, Intruders, or not Intruders, it's someone else, uh, Dimensions, Dimensions. Or something. Anyway, they came down with him and they said, well, we want to know what you think of this and, uh, you know, just give us your opinion if this jives. And I looked at the information and he explained it to me and I said, that has nothing to do with the craft that I worked on or any of the technology that I was involved in, you know, period. And uh, Jack really didn't appreciate that, but they asked for my opinion. So I said, and you know, as far as the conclusions he's drawn, I don't agree with him. I think they're completely wrong, and so on and so forth. <laughs> so he really didn't like me after that point. So he began to interview me, and he said, "Well, what did you do here and here?" And I went over things. And there's one, and this is on tape. I don't see why he would even make a fuss about it. But he said, "Well, well, what kind of equipment did you have to work with?" And I said, a wide variety of, you know, of different things. And he said, well, what about your bench? What was on your bench? I said, anything you'd find in a normal tech bench. I said, oscilloscopes, DVMs, things like that. And he said, okay. And then, you know, later I heard through the grapevine that you know, he's out doing a lecture at Bob Lazar, so he back-engineered the flying saucers with an oscilloscope and a DVM. And, you know, and this is on, it was on tape, and I, I think a lot of that's, he's really pretty pissed at me for shooting down the movie, but I had no idea that was going to be the effect, or else I, I would have reserved my opinion, you know, right. but uh, you know, it's just the way it goes. What was the physical layout of the compound where you worked at, like? Could you describe it? Uh, it was long, it was put up the side, on the side of the mountain range there, uh, where all the hangar doors went alongside, and then there's a long corridor that goes down in back of the hangars. <coughs> Uh, off that corridor comes uh, several rooms, only two or three of which I've been in, the medical area, the uh, lab that I work in, and then there's a small little room where I write some briefings and things along those lines, but I haven't been in any of the other rooms or know if there are things behind it or underneath it, so that's, that's all I can help you with on that. Um, last night, uh, uh, John Lear said that you uh, really didn't believe that there was anything unusual going on in those space shuttle shots. You thought it was ice particles, uh, you know, these ones they've been claiming are uh, yes, yes, particles. Oh, yeah. Uh, That's not ice, it's dust. 
<laughs> or dust, whatever. <laughs> There's no ifs, ands, or buts about that. You know, that's. Uh, Have you seen the Hoagland? Uh, yeah. Yeah, I've seen the whole thing. I've seen a copy from NASA, and it's, uh, you know, unfortunately, it would be neat if they were flying saucers, but if you see a bright white flash first, that's the positioning thruster firing on the, the left side of the shuttle. But the attitude of the shuttle didn't change, right? No, it doesn't, it, it, it normally doesn't do that. You know, they, the, those are station-keeping thrusters, and that, it all depends. If the thruster is firing in the direction of the shuttle, keeping its forward momentum, there'll be no attitude change. That's only if they're firing a pitch rocket will you see a change like that. And the fact that it flew forward means it was firing in the direction of the shuttle. So those little dots and things you see, I mean, I firmly believe, because I've seen other things along those lines, are right on the lens. They're not on the horizon. That's why you see a flash, there's a delay, and then particles that are normally floating in space, you see dart off like that because of the delay time from that. And, uh, you know, until I see something else that uh, leads me to believe this. I know it. it it looked neat, you know, like there was a flash and something came up from the ground, but if you just watch that and think that these are right against the lens, and that bright flash is one of the uh, uh, thrusters firing, that, uh, you know, you'll probably have a different opinion of it. But what about the right angle change? move? It's a 45 degree turn, which means it has to stop. Right, you're talking about little dust particles that are moving, and then when the thruster fired, you know, it doesn't. There's there's no mass to them, and they reverse there direction. There are other particles in the video that do the exact same thing. All <laughs> yeah, if you look at the whole video, and not just the crop down, there's all kinds of junk floating around. And when that thruster fires, there's about a one second delay, and everything goes flying off exactly no, like you'd expect. Everything goes flying off and drifting, except for one item that accelerates at like ten times the speed of all the other items in the video. Yeah, but there's there's. Have you seen Hoagland's detailed breakdown? Yeah. Okay, what about when he's talking about the light coming over the horizon of the planet, under the layer, I what he calls the layer, and over the ionosphere, but over the horizon? Yeah, but that doesn't, it, it still doesn't make sense. It, it, it doesn't take into account that something is right on the camera lens. Did the tape that you listened to, did it have the last transmission from Mission Control? They have the, the I, I really don't. I don't remember. No, I'm not standing on this like this is an absolute fact. But from what I from what I've seen, most of the tapes have had that edit off. Last of the tapes that heads up rad down, which means pay attention and keep your mouth shut. I don't know. I mean, that's that's my opinion, and I haven't I haven't seen anything to veer me from it. But you know, I I always remain open minded. But uh, <laughs> I don't know. That's all I can say. You mentioned the, the photons earlier. Do you think physics is taking a wrong turn by looking for exchange particles when you're talking about the strong force or gravity there? It's not clear on why you're skeptical about the graviton. About the graviton? Yeah. I mean, it, it, every, every other force seems to have an exchange particle connected with it. No, not necessarily. I mean, they make it have one, but uh, you know, as time goes on, that, uh, that really hasn't held true. Uh, and, and, you know, the bottom line is they don't, well, first of all, they don't even believe there's a graviton anymore, so I'm not the only one. Um, as far as exchange particles, you know, still, though some of them, like the zeta particle, maybe that's, maybe that's a, an actual thing, but, uh, you know, when they're looking at transfers of energy, I think these are scapegoats, you know, for the most part, and, uh, you know, a lot of the experiments that I was doing in Los Alamos uh, essentially was... Uh, along these same lines, but, uh, you know, other exchange particles like the intermediate vector boson, you know, I don't, I don't believe that thing exists. I really don't. I think they're grabbing at straws and just coming up with excuses. Did you use or see any, any kind of drawing, mechanical drawing or electrical schematics? Oh, any, sure. Any, any kind of documentation mm -hmm. yeah. special which we don't know? Uh, of what we knew of the amplifier and engineering layouts and things along those lines, and I've duplicated those. At, at home. Is there a difference in I mean the the ability for multi how is it affected by zero gravity? Well zero gravity is ideally what it wants. I don't think it wants in any other interactive gravity field. But it would be much harder to control though. No, not really. But as far as you know, there's never been any tests. No, no tests out of the atmosphere, you know, as of 1989 when I left. 
since it is controlling gravity, would it be possible that these things could either make themselves entirely invisible or a field of invisibility by bending the light around the outside of the ship? Yeah, I, 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 that's a byproduct of what's going on because, you know, just as you know, any large source of gravity bends light and you get an intense focus source like that and it's going to really distort it. Mm -hmm. Do I understand correctly that you just said that you duplicated the gravity amplifiers? Some of the equipment and most of the drawings, yeah. And when you say duplicate, you mean test it to see if it works? Uh, no, I'm not testing it because I don't have the facilities to do that. But like I mentioned to someone else earlier that uh, this summer I'll be patenting those drawings and that, uh, that device itself. So should anyone decide that all of a sudden they discovered it, since they've made no claim to it, I'll have the patent. Wait a minute. You don't know about this. Great. Right. Come on. Come on. You know, that's, that's really part of the Federation, the Intergalactic Patent Treaty. Don't you know about that? No, I didn't sign that. So it doesn't that's count. right. I'll take some ice water. Yeah. Yeah, sure. How do you build a gravity wave detector? Let's say you can determine the frequency and the source direction of a gravity wave emanating from the planet and other source. Well, I, actually, a gravity wave detector is a tough thing to make, and uh, there are there they are being made and. I don't exactly follow what they're doing, but I know the basis of, of what it is. It's a giant drum. It's uh, 20 or 30 feet long, and it's filled with dry cleaning fluid with carbon tetrachloride in there. And it rotates, and I haven't, I never paid much attention to it. I have no idea how that detects a uh, gravity wave, but uh, there's, I think Caltech has even funded funded one of them. Well, I didn't mean the gravity waves that you're talking about. The well, the gravity waves are gravity waves. What about the small gravity waves, gravity A? What is the, the frequency of that? The, well, the frequency the, that the actual reactor operates at is like 7.46 hertz. It's a very low frequency. That's the frequency of Earth's gravity or universally low gravity? That's the frequency that the reactor operates at. Do you use any computer process in the control process? Or? In the control process? No, I wasn't affiliated with that. Why, why would you suppose that... that the government would continue to spend these massive billions of dollars uh, on, a, on space projects that are extended you know, 20 years into the future when it knows it has this technology that would make them all obsolete tomorrow. Can you repeat the question? Oh, I want to know why the government would continue to spend millions and billions, I guess, of dollars on space projects when, you know, they have this technology. And, uh, well, first of all, you're assuming that, you know, the whole, the whole one of the government knows what's going on, and that's probably not the case. NASA probably isn't aware of what's going on here. Uh, second of all, just because they have this stuff, they haven't, you know, they, they haven't left the Earth with it, and they won't, so we still want to send things up in orbit, and uh, that's the most efficient way, you know, way we have of doing it, is essentially building a big firework to go up there. Um, but if they spent the same money in developing this technology, or half of it, uh, they, they'd probably be able to... Not necessarily. You know, sometimes all the money in the world doesn't get you anywhere. You know, though, though it helps. It, uh, and of course, if you want to keep something secret, you know that's out of the question. But you know, putting that aside, just dumping you know billions and billions of dollars into it, sure, you're going to make big strides and you get you know real reasonable people to work on the thing. But you're still going to get stuck, you know, around the area of where uh, you, you don't have the proper materials or you know the techniques required, uh, you know, to manufacture these things, and that's where you'll get stuck. If your patents or when the <coughs> patents get approved, what do you plan on doing at that point? Nothing. Just Nothing. paying the yearly fee to them and leave them alone. Comment on your debate table a little further. What happened? They really uh, didn't go into much. It was they wanted to know what we were doing out there, and uh, they went into, well, you know, we reviewed this was secret when we said it was secret. You know, we didn't mean bring your friends here and, you know, things along those lines. They had flown in uh, two of the guards that were on that truck uh, that were watching us. And it was my impression that they didn't know what was behind the mountain. 
what we were watching. They were just told to guard what was going on. I made it a point of bringing up the uh, you know, flying saucers and things of that sort. And uh, that's when they threatened me. That's when they mentioned the thing about my life. The way the reactor's operating, that the, uh, the, you know, the pulses that we detected out of it were probably, uh, you know, instead of a straight DC power supply, it was a lot more along the lines of a pulse, as if uh, you know, we were getting bursts of particles coming out uh, in any matter of emission and a reaction, a pulse of energy, and that would repeat. That's around you know, seven and a half hertz, something along those lines. Well, it's, they're one and the same. Well, I mean, gravity is, unfortunately, since physics, physics hasn't you know, gotten to that part yet, but gravity essentially is part of the electromagnetic spectrum. That's something I'm reserving for myself. Something about the microwave range. Something about the microwave range. Well, you know, you can kind of sort of figure it out by the dimensions of the, uh, um, the waveguide itself and... Uh, you know, that's about it. No, it's not photon. Right. I'm not trying to be secret, but this is part of the equipment that I'm working on, and you know, I want to get it operating before. Uh... Well, we'll find out one day. Absolutely. Did you ever get any idea through any documentation or anything that this kind of alien technology is being researched or tested at any other planets? <laughs> no. Bob, this information at S4 about gravity, propulsion, and so on, control, wave control, what does that do to endeavors like Kip Thorne at Caltech with his LIGO wanting to spend tens of millions or multiplied millions on this light interferometry gravity observatory? I mean, doesn't it rather mothball that? It does, and that's just another reason for people not to, <clears throat> you know, look at this from a realistic point of view, because it really will shoot down a lot of research effort like that. Exactly. Uh, you know, it's, it shouldn't. It shouldn't. It's, uh, research like that should go on anyway, if, if for nothing else, just to prove that it doesn't work. You know, that's... Uh, <laughs> uh, can I ask a follow-up? I'm sorry. Uh, can you speculate as to how you think they found us, or why they came to us? I, you can you can speculate as as well as I can. I really can't. Uh, you know, can't I, I mean, would, would would anything in their in their technology seem to imply that they can well, just sense of, life anywhere else? Or uh, it doesn't seem like just randomly flying around the block, around the galaxy. No, but if the documentation was correct about genetic ma manipulation, they didn't have to find us. They put us here. <laughs> they didn't just happen to snoop around Roswell one day, right? Probably not. Hmm? Did you ever hear anyone allude to the fact that maybe the Russians might have their own area escort? I know. George Knapp just got back from Russia, and uh, I spoke with him recently, and he purchased, since <laughs> apparently the whole country's up for sale, I guess he purchased from the KGB and the Russian government all information pertaining to flying saucers, so <laughs> he's got that information. And, uh, <laughs> Yeah, I think they're, uh, his company, Altamira Corporation, that financed the whole trip and the whole nine yards, I guess, will be releasing that, but he's got uh, all that stuff. Just a couple more, I'm really beat. Bob, how much worse made you come up here because of the atomic blast or the wind of us in the Plutonium Valley, the property of the Jordan's exit miles away, but whatever happened to the Plutonium of the U-238 that's been dispersed here, around this area and fall out and went up to uh, Cedar City. How much, according to that EPA monitor, a quarter mile away, we're about four times the, the background dose that we've been getting in Los Angeles. Of oh, plutonium? <coughs> because yeah, when an atomic bomb or a thermonuclear bomb detonates, really the most of plutonium, though it, it doesn't you know, all go into fusion uh, or fission for that matter, it, um, into fission, no, hydrogen goes into fusion, uh, is really consumed in the fireball. And you know the other fallout products, the radioactive iodine, the strontium-90, and things like that, those are all over the place, and they're still around. Um, but you know, time has gone by, though most of them haven't even reached their half-life yet, but they are diluted in a large amount of space. And uh, 
you know, it's relatively safe. The concentrations aren't that high. So if we went down to Groom Lake Road and got chased out by the guards and all the dust that got in the automobile. Oh, that's no problem. You know, you die of something else way before that. <laughs> <laughs> so, Bob, the Cash Landrum saucer that gave us off this tremendous radioactive radiation and causing these ladies irreparable harm. How does that fit? That's obviously not element 115 gravity wave. Percussion. No, it's not. I think that was, I'm not even convinced that that was a, you know, alien craft. That might have been a government attempt at a nuclear-powered craft, incredibly dirty, <laughs> obviously, that, uh, and they, you know, just looking at some of the, you know, medical photographs, the burns and, their, you know, the loss of hair, uh, you know, it was either gamma or, neut or neutron radiation and, uh, I don't know what the status is. Well, that brings up another question. Our friend Jeff, who actually saw the saucer up close, it shot out at him right at mailbox. He, he saw it up close. He's our, we showed that earlier, by the way. Anyway, he said that he got a, a sort of a sunburn, probably from UV. It's, is it possible he's crafty about off? Well, UV? beta burn is also, uh, oh, looks beta. like sunburn, uh, you know, uh, yeah. uh, beta particles, electrons. It looks exactly like sunburn. So this would be the radiation from the craft then, the excess? Uh, the yeah, but, you know, if he just were going for a blood cell test, a, uh, you know, a high white cell count will, you know, verify that it was radiation exposure because you get that, you know, reflex operation. Nice. Bob, I know it isn't your first choice to make public appearances like this, so I just want to tell you, in case nobody else states it clearly enough, that we all of us really appreciate you coming out here and speaking. I'm kind of late, so uh, I'll just turn it back over to Gary here and uh, <laughs> sit in the bar or something along those lines. Thanks, well, thank you. Thank you. Well, is protected by the power of the respective governments and is used to perpetuate the conspiracy's vast wealth by the creation of money out of nothing. Two, in the United States, this monetary fraud is perpetuated through the Federal Reserve System. Although the executive branch theoretically has some control over the system through occasional appointments, in reality, it is the system and those behind it who control the executive branch. Three, the capitalist conspiracy in this country surfaces to public view in the form of the semi-secret Council on Foreign Relations. Its members exercise their control over the nation through government.